from the American Society for Microbiology. This is TWIV, This Week in Virology, a special episode recorded on September 20th, 2016. Hi everybody, I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to the podcast all about viruses. Today we're coming to you from EID A to Z, the Emerging Infectious Diseases A to Z Conference is being held at Boston University in Boston, Massachusetts. And joining me today from Western Massachusetts, Alan Dove. Good to be here. Good to be back with you. Yeah. We recorded an episode of TWIV with David Guaman the other day. So look for that this Sunday. It was pretty exciting. And we have a special co-host joining us today from Boston University, Paul Dupre. Welcome. Nice to be back. We will provide subtitles for Paul's commentary. <laughs> <laughs> it has been requested before that we do so. You're not insulted, right? I, uh, will, provi <laughs> <laughs> I will provide no answer since you're the guest. OK. <laughs> so uh, this is a podcast for probably three quarters of you don't know, have, have any idea what we're doing. But every week, we record one of these This Week in Virologies. We're over episode 408. We've been downloaded over 5 million times by about 20 to 30,000 loyal listeners. So we do this every week. Sometimes we do it on the road in front of an audience with wonderful guests, which is what we're going to do today. And 200 episodes ago, number 200, we got to do a documentary at The Needle. We did a video documentary along with the American Society for Microbiology. The entire TWIV crew was there. It's really exciting. And it, we walked through the entire facility. And uh, you should check that out. All right, we have taken from this meeting a few of the guests. Now, before I introduce them, Paul, you divided this meeting into four sections, discover, understand, protect, and collaborate. Maybe you could just briefly explain why you did that. So whenever we were trying to come up with a title for this meeting, we got together in a room and we battled around ideas and it went backwards and forwards and backwards and forwards. Um, and we talked about how we would deal with social media and what we would do and how to get a hashtag that was unique. And we ended up with EID mm -hmm. A mm -hmm. to Z, or as I said the other day. A to Z. A to Z, right. as I used to say it. <laughs> um, and what w then you want to do, if you're going to go from A to Z, you need to tell a story. And David Quammen talked a lot about telling stories. And the story that we wanted to tell in this meeting was how do we go into the field? How do we go from the field to finding the viruses? How do we then begin to work with them and went through some case studies? And that's all about the discovery side mm -hmm. of emerging infectious diseases. Right. Then you need to get them into the lab, which is why needle exists, so that we can work with these BSL-2, biosafety level two, biosafety level three, four pathogens. And we can pick them apart. And we heard all about how, how they're picked apart. We got down into the weeds with, with the detail. And then this morning, we talked about protect. Mm -hmm. And we really then went into the new vaccines, antivirals, antimicrobial resistance, all of those ways in which you fight against the viruses that you've discovered and that you're trying to understand how do we protect us and our animals against them. And then this afternoon, um, one of the real key things that we want to do in Needle is collaborate. We talked a lot about that this morning as well. How do we reach out of this room? And how do we reach out of this room as well? We live stream this, so this is why we appreciate that we get to partner with you and the American Society for Microbiology. We get to partner with M Sphere. Uh, you're an I editor on that. Did you know that? I'm an I editor. That's right. And we're going to put together some pieces, opinion pieces, to to discover, to understand, to protect, and then to collaborate. Because we want to collaborate. Well, there's no point having a conversation just in this room. We want to bring it elsewhere. So that's where M Sphere comes in. And then we also get to partner with uh, the Society for Microbiology, formerly SGM. Uh, and we have them here as well as our international partners because the societies of microbiology and the discipline of microbiology is bigger than just uh, Massachusetts right. and, and, and America. It, it's a global thing. 
fact, that was a message from this meeting, collaboration. Yeah. You can't do it on your own. You have to collaborate. And you'll hear more about today. So what we, Paul and I, did was go through the program and pick four people, one from each of these sections. So here they are before you. So let's introduce them and start talking uh, to them. To Paul's left, uh, she is from the Erasmus Medical Center in the Netherlands. Marion Koopmans, welcome. Yes, glad to be here. Uh, next to Marion from St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee, Stacy Schultz Cherry, welcome back. Thank you, thank you for having me. Because you've been on TWIV before. I have. Uh, at the American Society for Microbiology. Uh, next to Stacy from the German Center of Infection Research in Bonn, Germany, Felix Drexler, welcome. Hi, thanks for, for having me here. And uh, next to Felix from the uh, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, Ralph Barrick. Vincent, good seeing you again. It was just last week <laughs> Ralph, that I was so on TWIV. TWIV last week, <laughs> uh, which has not yet gone up because I have to still edit it, but should go up in the next day or so. Thanks for coming. Uh, and then, of course, Alan Dove all the way at the end there. So each of these individuals are from one of those sections. Um, and I'll tell you as we go along. So let's start with Marion, since she's right next to you. We have you from the protect section. And your message today was trying to get diagnostic capabilities from the lab out to where you need it. Can you tell us all about that? Yes, that's something that I feel quite strongly about. And that comes from sitting through several of these outbreak investigations. I'm a vet and I've worked in public health, so I've been involved a lot in outbreak response with, with bird flu, with uh, Q fever, we had a big Q fever outbreak in the Netherlands. Um, there was of course SARS, then we've, had, we've seen MERS. So in all these situations, essentially, uh, you bump into the same problems, which is the lack of uh, uh, the capacity to detect them early enough before they really become a problem. And uh, so that's why uh, also in discussing with Paul what should be the focus of this session, I felt it would be good to talk about that. Um, it's one thing to develop diagnostics. I, we've gotten really good at that over the past decade or so. So we, we identify an outbreak, uh, there's sequencing, you can very rapidly make PCRs. But uh, what does it really take to advance that a bit? Uh, what if we had better capacity for testing diarrheal patients in Sierra Leone and Guinea, including testing them for Ebola. What would that have done uh, if that happened much earlier? So but that's really... You even mentioned that in Europe, many parts of Europe, you know, have good diagnostic capabilities as well, never mind Sierra Leone, right? So that, yes, and I think that's probably true here in the U.S. as well. If you, so part is, do people go to see a doctor? Uh, does that doctor mm -hmm. uh, think about testing? And then also what, what kind of testing is available? Uh, right. I heard here in the meeting that, for instance, Zika testing is not widely available uh, right now here in the U.S. And that's part of what we need to deal with everywhere. Well, and I assume you need to find a balance, too, because the emerging infectious diseases are going to be rare events. This is not going to be part of daily medical practice. And you certainly don't want physicians ordering tests on everybody for Zika virus if they have no known exposures, but you want those available if, if necessary. Yeah, and I think this is really the tough part. Mm -hmm. So the, the, so we want to be restrictive with costly diagnostics normally. Uh, you don't want to be spending a lot of money on on big panels that, that produce information that the clinician is not using. At least I personally would like or to see that. Or information that they use erroneously. Uh, that, yeah, I'm not so worried about that one. But then in an outbreak situation, then all of a sudden we want that capacity up. And that's just, you know, that's a tough balance. So what kind of, what kind of diagnostics are you talking about? You told me yesterday, and you said in your talk today, you're, you are really excited about the latest generation diagnostics. Give us some examples. Yeah, so I think because the, uh, uh, these emerging diseases are so uh, unpredictable, we need to look at broader catch-all diagnostics. And there's the two categories that I think uh, are coming into play that you also have in, in diagnosing any virus infection. One is looking at serology, but then 
antibody arrays that take uh, that, that measure antibodies to a, a range of different viruses mm -hmm. or uh, variants of the same family, for instance, uh, the coronaviruses and including MERS, including SARS. So you can measure that all together in one single shot, essentially. And the same is on the other side, on the molecular side. And it's looking at uh, how far we can get with these next generation mm -hmm. uh, sequencing based tests that is not really ready and ripe for the clinic, but I think um, a lot can be done and things, and certainly for outbreak investigations, uh, th there's a lot of promise there. Mm -hmm. And whenever we looked at the gaps, can you see, as someone who knows public health, those next generation sequencing approaches being available in, in 10 years, 20 years, what, what's the time frame? Um, I tend to think even sooner. Uh, um, we saw here at the meeting there was this uh, handheld sequencer almost, uh, uh, you know, it was shown and that was used during the Ebola outbreak and it is being used now with Zika, you know, with people driving around generating sequence data. Um, so I think it's going very fast. I, there's the other side that we need to figure out how to really work with that data because everyone, you know, it's cool and funky, but what information does it really generate and how does it help you? Understanding an outbreak like that or tracking uh, an outbreak and we have to be sure that we're drawing the right conclusions from, the, from it. But I think that's a very fast moving field. And do you see those being deployed in a veterinary setting as well as medical setting? Yes, in fact, I think the veterinary field is quite far ahead there. Um, well, I the barriers are certainly lower. No, not really, because uh, if you have a false diagnosis in the veterinary world, you can have okay. big economic impact. So uh, I don't think that's... Uh, but we've seen examples, for instance, that we had a big outbreak of Schmallenberg that I like to call uh, sort of the, the veterinary Zika virus. <laughs> Um, it was a big outbreak, huge uh, spread, and that was picked up from specimens of, of uh, clinical syndrome in cattle with next generation sequencing. Okay. You, you mentioned another issue, which is you said that the current model for accrediting diagnostics is not working. It takes too long. Tell us about that. Yeah, so I, I don't mean to say that that's not a good thing. We have no. to be sure that we are testing, that we know what we're testing, what the quality is, and that's that well, well controlled. But if we have an outbreak situation, you have to move faster. You cannot mm -hmm. wait for the, the long time it takes. Um, plus, in these outbreak situations, what we have is a lack of free agents. So it takes a careful process of validation before you really can pass all the, 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 the tests that are needed to get a fully accredited test, and those are not available. Um, for instance, look at MERS, coronavirus, there's antibody testing, and just now, WHO has put a panel together, just now, that's four years, four years. Mm -hmm. later. <laughs> so we cannot wait until that full uh, accreditation has been done to start using these assays. Mm -hmm. So what we are saying, and that's something that we're doing a lot in the European uh, uh, collaboration that Felix is also part of, is turning it around and say, okay, we have to be uh, clear that we don't know exactly what these tests are doing, that we are building the ship while sailing, and we have to share our experiences and you know, also be clear to the clinicians, this is what we are fairly sure of, but this is what we don't know, and then build the knowledge while, while using it. Right, so tell me, do we currently have accredited Zika diagnostics? I'm not sure, I don't think so. I'm not sure if there's a, something under the FDA fast, uh, fast track. Uh, well, there's, um, so there are two levels of this. I'm not sure what, exactly what the European situation is, but in the US under CLIO, which regulates medical labs, um, <laughs> For diagnostic testing, you have the fully approved tests that can be done by any medical lab. There's also a kind of a, um, uh, a provision or a loophole, depending on where you stand on it, that um, allows any laboratory that meets certain specifications to develop a homebrew test yeah. that they can run on their own. They're allowed to use that. They assume a certain amount of liability for it, but it is legal and they can 
use those tests. So what you're talking about is the full approval. Yes, I do. Whereas you could, you could very rapidly develop diagnostic tests for any new emerging infections, deploy it under this CLIA um, measure that would allow you to run it as a homebrew test. Um, a limited number of laboratories would be able to do that. And that can be done, but what you're saying is we need a mechanism that does the, the full vetting faster. If we want to get the sort of the agreed assays out everywhere, but right. yes, this, this in-between mechanism is something that we also have in Europe and that is going very fast. So from, uh, that was with, with MERS, uh, with Ebola, with Zika, the moment there's a sequence then people start to design primer sets. Uh, Felix is actually quite good at that um, and those are then uh, shared uh, uh, and uh, published and uh, people can start using them, yeah. Uh, just as a, as a quick uh, addition to that, I think when we talk about regulations we need, and that's something that came up in the last session, we need to think about authorizations in the affected countries in these resource pool settings. And it's actually really, I think it's really impressive that Brazil has, has provided, uh, has approved serologic, even serologic assays for IgG already, and that's months ago. Yeah. So they're in that sense much quicker than, than FDA. Right. I mean, one of the issues that was brought up in the session for TECT was if you want to validate a test, you often have to get specimens from other countries that are known positives, and that's very hard to do. So that's something we have to fix also, right? Yeah, so part of the fixing is bringing the assays to the countries, I guess, and have mm -hmm. people yeah. uh, uh, there in the affected regions uh, validate the assays. That's, a, I think, a good model. Um, but it's not always possible um, and right now what is also going on is for instance travelers uh, using travelers yeah. but there I think we do need to get better in, in, in working together on that because there's a lot of well there's a lot of people that are trying to get at the same samples and yeah. uh, this, this is something I heard over and over again it's no longer the science is no longer send me your sample mm -hmm. and I'll work on it and publish it it's establish the capability in the country where the outbreak is and let them do the work. Yeah. And that's beautifully illustrated in Nicaragua, uh, where Eva Harris has established capabilities, right? And that's what Ian Goodfellow tried to do. Um, so that's almost going to be the title of this episode. I had one. Oh, yes, you had a good one. What yeah. was it? Uh, uh, par partnerships, partnerships, not, not, not parachutes. parachutes. Yes, that was from Ian Goodfellow. Slides. Thank you very much. We'll probably use that for one more. I have one more question for you. Uh, you mentioned a goal of a dollar for these tests uh, for both serology and, and next generation sequencing or each one a dollar or both a dollar? Well, preferably together a dollar. Is that, is that feasible? Is, is that feasible? Well, I think, you know, we have uh, come up in this meeting with several sort of future, you know, dots at the horizon. Yeah, this would yeah. be my dot on the horizon. It needs to be much, much cheaper. Um, yeah to be realistic yeah. and, well, why not? Now, it's good to set a goal that gives you something to work towards and if you don't exactly meet it. And that's why we wanted the meeting to be zeroing in on the gaps. Yeah. You know, really yeah. look, <coughs> excuse me, look to the future yeah. and see where you are now but have a great aspiration for where you want to be. Sure. This meeting has been unusual because um, we have nice chairs here. That's one thing. And the people that, are sitting that is at, actually kind of unusual among me. People are sitting at tables. But also the microphones. Does anybody have one of those mics you can throw me? Those are great. Yeah, yeah. Let's do this on video. Yes. See if I can catch it. Thank you very much. This is a microphone, all right? It's a catch box. And you can throw it around a room. Instead of having someone run around, you can do this. This is brilliant. Whose idea was this? Jerry's. Jerry. Jerry Kush. Brilliant. Thank you so much. He can even, Toss it. He can even I don't want, I mean, I'm afraid of the chandelier. You've been telling me. <laughs> don't hit the camera. Oops. <laughs> <laughs> nice uh, catch. Almost got the computer. Okay. Yeah. All right. Um, next, next on the couch there, Stacy Schultz Cherry. I put you in the collaborate part, even though you weren't part of a collaborate session. Because I know you collaborate with WHO, and I thought maybe you could tell us about how you pick the, the new flu vaccine every year. Oh boy. <laughs> so just a little background. Um, St. Jude actually has a World Health Organization collaborating center for influenza viruses. And 
we're unique from the five other collaborating centers in that we're really focused on the animal-human interface. And so we're very much responsible for looking at those, we call them pre-pandemic, so any of the zoonotics, the, the bird flus, um, we watch the variant H1N2s and H3N2s that are jumping from pigs into children at agricultural fairs. And then we bring that information to the strain selection meeting twice a year and decide on candidate vaccine viruses. And actually that is coming up next week. Um, we've had many if people don't know the process. It's really interesting. It starts with, you know, everybody collecting sequence information throughout the year. In terms of seasonal flu, it's all of your national influenza centers, which I think there's about 145 now around the world. And for our, the animal portion, we work very closely with the veterinary sector, the agricultural sector, so OAE, FAO, which is sort of the WHO equivalent to, um, for the animal world. And we share information, not just sequences, but also ferret antisera. So we have antisera raised to different viruses that we not just check the genetics of the circulating viruses, but also antigenicity. So how similar is that virus that's out circulating in the community to the vaccine virus that's available? For the human seasonals, there's also panels of human sera that's shared to make sure again that in vaccinated people, they're still responding to the vaccine. So you start about two months in advance with um, for us, it's usually 5.30 a.m. conference calls. And Two months in advance of what? what like when is it? Uh, uh, in, in advance of the strain selection meeting, which is held in September. It's actually next week in Geneva where we'll choose the strains for the Southern Hemisphere. And then in February is when we choose the strains for the Northern Hemisphere. And you start with these conference calls where you start sharing data. They're very large data packages. The calls are usually about three hours. Um, and now the zoonotics take about as much time as some of the seasonal mm -hmm. viruses do because it's become so complicated. When I first started going, which is five years ago now, I'm deputy director of our center, it was H5N1. That's what we discussed. And since then, it's now H5, H10, H6. It's like alphabet soup. And we talk about the data. We start making some decisions, but you really wait till we're all in the room together. So we start on a Monday morning, you work all day for three days going through every bit of data that's been provided from these national influenza centers around the world, the collaborating centers, and discussing, and you start with the zoonotics, then we talk about seasonal H1, seasonal H3, the B viruses, and we just look at all of this data and make decisions on what should be in the strain or in the, the vaccine the next year. So we really are looking at things in advance. And we know that there are problems with this. So we bring in a lot of expertise, including um, Derek Smith and his group that does a lot of the antigenicity and antigenic mapping, which helps us to understand if we see antigenic differences, how far apart are they from the vaccine? Should we be concerned? Are they drifting enough that we need to make decisions? We've also been working more closely with Trevor Bedford, who's come up with some really clever ways of predicting viral evolution using computer modeling. So there's been many, many extra meetings on, are we making the best decisions that we possibly can? Do we have all the information? And looking at moving forward constantly with the new technology, tools and information that's available to make those very important decisions about what um, viruses should go into your vaccine strain. Because when we have to change a strain, it is, it is made, there's a lot of discussion, because it's not a simple decision. You know, you're asking manufacturers to change. They may have already started production. You're asking, especially nowadays where there's so much anti-vaccine information and a lot of questions about the flu vaccine efficacy is we're very, very careful that we're making the best possible decision that we can. But it's important to realize that our decisions are only based on the surveillance information that we have. So as we see a decrease in resources, one thing that often gets cut is surveillance because 
people don't appreciate how important it, and I never did, I'm trained in basic research, and so when they said, you're gonna go stop, start swabbing duck butts, I was like, we're gonna do what? <laughs> so, and that's, that's what you get from people, is why in the world are you doing that? And that's why, so that we have that information about what's circulating, and we're making the resources to be able to make these really important public health decisions. This sounds like an American jury. Does you, do you ever get a hung jury? We do. You can't decide? We do, <laughs> absolutely. There's been some really um, exciting conversations. That's probably the best <laughs> Spirited, way to put it. Perhaps. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's difficult for certain countries, especially very large countries like China, they may have different strains circulating in different parts of the country. So what do you choose? Do you choose a northern hemisphere for northern China and a southern hemisphere? So there's a lot of discussions that go into that, especially years where we see there's a lot of changes going on in different countries. And it does lead to a lot of very interesting and exciting these are, decisions. These are all conference calls. You don't have to go there. No, right? we go there. And so, Stacey, who, who's the we? Just give us a sense sure, of who, I can give who's you who the, the we. we? Give us the international distribution sure. of the we. So the we that gets to go to the meeting um, twice a year are the representatives, the director and the assistant or deputy director from the collaborating centers. And the collaborating centers are based in Atlanta, CDC, Australia, um, London, China, and Japan, and then us as the zoonotic or animal-human interface. So the directors and the deputy directors, they may bring a small team with them. Um, there's also invited representatives from the National Influenza Centers, a very small group of those. And we're fortunate in that now we can bring in people from the veterinary sector. People come from OIE, FAO, occasionally some of the H5 reference laboratories. So there's probably about 30 of us. And we were really excited last year in September when we hosted the meeting in, at St. Jude. And it was the first time the strain selection meeting had ever been in the United States. So about 30 people, mm -hmm. I envisioned hundreds and hundreds. Nope. So 30 is more manageable. Yes. And what's the longest time you've spent deliberating? Oh boy, there's, so you really only have Monday through Wednesday, which is why these, these phone calls are so important to make your decisions because while you're discussing the data, you also have to write all of the literature that will get put online, and Thursday morning is the reveal day. So that's the day that manufacturers are invited in and we reveal what the strains are gonna be. Reveal so day. I reveal love day. It. <laughs> so everything is very confidential, and there have been meetings. I remember the first meeting I went to, I was like, is it always like this? It's, it's an interesting process, because you'll be 8 a.m. until oftentimes late at night in some of the most I guess heated discussions were how do you name a virus? So when the 2009 pandemic, or when you see these bird flu, you can't call it swine flu because it has very negative cons you know, for the swine industry. So there's a lot of discussion about nomenclature mm -hmm. um, and everything has to be written. And it's a very interesting process in that you write up the documents and then you read them out loud over and over and over again. And we argue people that speak American English versus proper English <laughs> argue about where comma should be, for example, <laughs> um, how you spell things. Right. Stacey, yeah. how many votes are there? Is it, is it, are there seven votes? Is so that? I'm very pleased to say I'm not allowed to vote. So if the vaccine's wrong, it wasn't me. So. I'm also pleased to say that because I'm not from this country, yeah. I'm not also allowed to vote this year. Yeah. <laughs> so the, the votes are the directors the directors of each of the collaborating centers. So give us an idea of how much data we're talking about. How many sequences and serological tests, how many isolates? I can tell you it, it is unbelievable, and especially if it's been a very active year, mm -hmm. how much data goes into it. So I can't give you the exact number of sequences, but I can tell you I come home with a binder that's this thick. It's oh, one of those- Printed out? They print it all out, wow. which is great. They've tried doing it by Dropbox, but then we would print out because you you're ripping papers apart and drawing on things. And so it's literally a three ring binder full of information. It takes up a lot of chocolate space, which is not good when you're coming home from Geneva. <laughs> I don't know how you can digest all that information. It seems to me that- the Information, not the chocolate. The, yeah, well, you <laughs> do a lot of homework in advance. It's yeah. a very intense, 
about month leading up to it where we're trying to prepare our package with our information as well as digest everybody else's information because you can't go to this not prepared. So you come with questions and that's where these teleconferences are really helpful. Now when you don't have a good match, yes. do you feel badly about that? Absolutely, absolutely. And you know, the, the H3 seasonal viruses are really difficult right now. They're difficult to isolate. They won't grow well. The biggest problem, and it really started about two, three years ago, is people would say, oh, you chose the wrong H3 strain. No, we didn't. The, the strain is absolutely correct. The problem is as soon as that human virus, and the H3s are very much human viruses, go into an egg, they change. And they change very quickly. And what we ended up with was a glycosylation site that impacted antigenicity. So we had the right family of H3, but we had to find vaccine strains that wouldn't go through this rapid evolution. So it makes it very, very difficult. Yeah, so there's a lot of science involved as well. It's very interesting. It's, you must have learned a lot over the years, right, doing this. I did, I did. I never thought I would make phylogenetic trees or understand, <laughs> so I've really had to learn a lot. And you know, I appreciate that when I went to St. Jude, Richard Webby gave me the opportunity because he had never had a deputy director before. So you're doing a reveal for the Southern Hemisphere in mm -hmm. a couple weeks? You can't, tell us what the, you can't tell us what that is, right? But, nope, I'd have to um, shoot you. You'd have to shoot me? <laughs> well, then some There's people might like big that. Data, uh, but we need to have it to yeah. 500. <laughs> yeah. And then after that, you can we'll shoot, shoot you. Yeah. Okay. So it'll all be, the meeting is next week. So next Thursday, you can go to the WHO site and see what the strains were for this year. I'll be sure to tweet it out. Yeah, it's great. And one thing people don't realize is that we actually make some of these candidate vaccine viruses at St. Jude. We have a GMP facility, so we make some of those zoonotic ones at St. Jude. So how long have you been doing this now? Five years. And does it go on forever, or can you say it's enough? Um, I think eventually, because I have so many other hats I have to wear right yeah. now. Right. I told I told Richard I'm not going to go to Geneva next week, which my lab is not happy with me. But it it's a lot of work. It's unbelievable, and it's very exciting. And you know, I'm glad to have the opportunity here to actually explain to people what goes into the process because yeah, it's, it's very complicated. I always wanted you to do that, so thank you. Uh, Felix, let's talk about what you talked about. By the way, um, your, your lovely paper, Evolutionary Origins of Hepatitis A Virus in Small Mammals, we did a TWIV on that probably two years ago or a year ago, well, shortly after it came out. Someone told us we should do it. Yeah, we discussed it. It was very Thank nice. Thank you for listening. <laughs> <laughs> well, we just discovered that you'd never heard of TWIP, right? <laughs> well, now you have. So you, from what I understand, you like to go out into the nature and collect viruses that might be a threat. Or into the attic, at least. Or in the attic. And you've published lots of papers on various isolations of different viruses from mm. different animals. So what's the overall goal? Well, the overall goal is, is, is to, under, well, it, first we have the overall goal to understand the origins of human pathogenic viruses. Mm -hmm. So, th so that's, um, that's a very intellectual goal which we like to follow up because, and it, and it translates into something more pra tangible, which is um, the dissemination of, 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 uh, of the information that actually so much more is of zoonotic origin than we used to think, and that the perception of human only pathogens that would really just be relevant for human health is, probably more and more outdated. I mean, you know, whole groups of viruses and viral genera and families just are falling under zoonosis. And I think that's, that's a very important piece of information that other groups and we have been generating. Um, at the same time, a second goal of all this is to understand the evolution, not only of viruses, but the evolution of viral transmission change, again, with the goal that we can, pre well, not predict, but understand how viruses would behave if they ever made their way into humans. And finally, um, and maybe the most complicated goal is to, to be able finally to make some sort of prediction, which is the most difficult part, because um, we have to be careful with over-promising um, in other words, we have to find a way of communicating why we are doing all this, and that, that's why you're asking. So, so we have to be careful that, of course, just diversity knowledge itself does not predict the next pandemic, the, the coming mm -hmm. plague. 
Um, so you really, and then there's many ways to answer this. There's a very computational way, which is excellent, and there's so many groups and, 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 and uh, that are, have re are really developing novel approaches and tools of how we can understand what are properties, what are what are parts of viral genomes that may be particularly usable as pathogenesis markers, as, as, as risk markers. And at the same time, we all know as virologists how difficult it is uh, to, to get to isolate many of these viruses. We, I mean, we failed miserably over so many years for so many pathogens, and we've tried, mm -hmm. and others have tried, and, and there's a few successes. Um, we heard from, from Peter the, the success of, or Peter Daszak, the success of isolating SARS from bats, which was the first time. And, and it's great they, they succeeded. So that's, that, and that's where we can have a very powerful tool for predictions. And if we don't isolate, then we rely on new techniques that are actually very synthetic, uh, very collaborative in generating constructs that will allow us functional analysis. Well, it strikes me that in, in vaccine development, people talk about finding the correlates of protection, correlates mm. of immunity. And what you're doing is sort of the opposite side of that. You're looking for the correlates of threat or the correlates mm -hmm. of pathogenesis. Yeah, and um, I guess it's, 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 it's a contribution because we, I mean, you know, we've talked a lot about in this meeting about coming too late. Uh, and, 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 you know, we, and, and Marion pointed that out. So, so, so it's really, there's so many pillars of that. There's the rapid response, there's the infrastructure building, as in, you know, the collaboration building, but there's also something preemptive. And, and I wonder how, how we can get there. I'm, I'm not sure, you know, but, but it's, it's stepwise, we're getting closer. To, to be able to deliver something which we can use. I, I wouldn't underestimate the value of finding out where human viruses came from. I have a feeling if you just went and asked any one random person, you know, they, would, they might know that SARS came from bats or maybe Ebola came from bats, but most other viruses, if you said poliovirus came from an animal, and we don't know what animal it is, they would say, really? I thought it was a human virus or even measles. So I think the more, you know, and we have to communicate this, right? Which is part of why we do podcasts like this. But I think it's important to do that. I think it's, I think it's extremely exp important. And I mean, you're mentioning measles, and measles is such a good example because um, we've heard it in the talk from Inga, Inga Damon. We had all, all the information. She, she, you know, she wrapped it up about smallpox eradication, which is really the one time we, we got there ever. And, um, and now we know what's on the list. It's polio, and it will maybe be measles. And, and I think it's crucial to know if there's an animal reservoir. And it's crucial to know if there's uh, anything related to polio, if there's anything related to, to, to variola major. I, I mean, that's, that's crucial to know, because it may really change everything. Have you ever looked at ancestors of polio at all? I've always wondered, because we have no clue, as far as I can tell. Yeah, we've, 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 we haven't looked for polio specifically. We've, we had one, one project, uh, painful very painful project where we looked for enteroviruses in general. Mm -hmm. And that, that became a very frustrating subject. Uh, we haven't even published the data yet. Um, that's, that's for many reasons painful. The variabil variability of the enteroviruses is so high that it's very hard to detect them reliably. Then enterovirus, as, as you know better than many, many other people, are, uh, are shed in matrices that are not easy for detection. So there's a reason we see so much NGS findings from near cell-free cell fluids. That's because that's what we can manage um, because the host background is so small. And as soon as we try feces, it, it becomes a real nightmare. And, and so I'm, I'm, I've never found anything close to polio in, in an animal. Um, but I mean... Never. Yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> and what drew you off to Felix? So you think polio, I think measles. What drew you off to Felix um, was whenever we saw his paper, what, 2012, the, the paramyxo, yeah. and, and Felix had discovered all of these paramyxoviruses and all of these different bats. But as soon as we saw vampire bats mm -hmm. with a virus which is 90%, What's the percentage you, you know the measles in the tree? To the to measles to the DRMV, the vampire bat morbelli virus. I don't remember precisely, and it's it's the, the point. But I'm actually not. So it's not the next measles. This this of virus. Course. It's it's an. But that's where the beauty is, the evolutionary beauty, because exactly. it's an ancestral virus, which goes back to the origin of morbelli viruses. And then remember, we talked all about how this virus, in some some of its, that's not all, that's not all published because by the time we were doing that paper, we just had a small piece of the polymerase fragment. But how in some of the genes and the structural genes that we now have uh, sequenced, 
Um, it's, it's, it sort of jumps between the distemper clade of mobility viruses and the mobility clade, and that sort of may add up in the end so nicely with the ecology because it's a vampire bat that only occurs in Latin America and that we know from the anecdotal evidence that and a few papers from uh, from a few groups that the origin of distemper is projected to 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 to, to Latin America or to the American continent so I mean I, I'm not sure we need much more data but uh, that may may add to a very nice hypothesis so give us an idea of wh where you look do you wait for things to happen or do you do surveillance continuously in your group no, um, I think you need hypothesis where to look. Uh, our funding would not permit us to look everywhere all the time and longitudinally so that you could have an idea when a virus is cooking up in a certain population. Yeah, no. Um, so that's, and it's painful uh, and a bit dumb. Painful? <laughs> the second time someone said, yeah. did you say painful? Mm -hmm. And someone said tortuous today. I think yeah. Um, yeah. Who said tortuous? Yeah. Peter Palazzi said yeah. tortuous. <laughs> we don't want you to get the idea that virology is hard. It's not. <laughs> no, it's really easy. <laughs> it's just simple. <laughs> it's not simple. It's not always simple. No, no so, um, so, so it's, it, but it's important to, to communicate that as well. I remember a WHO meeting um, on MERS years ago where a WHO official that was before the camel link. So we had the first evidence for, 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 you, for, for, for Erasmus findings in the camels. And uh, it was carefully being discussed. You were on Skype in that meeting, by the way. Uh, it was, I was, uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and I didn't actually think it was camels. Yeah, Nobody well, believed the serology, actually. Yeah. <laughs> that was one of those examples where mm -hmm. you, you really have to discuss what does it really mean. And it, was not, and it wasn't straightforward. But, uh, but so at that meeting, that WHO official um, said, he, I, I don't know why he, he said, he was like, oh, you're just sampling everything that moves. And, you, you, and, and I said no, and I actually had an, a small argument with him because, uh, because it, that was not the case. We were not randomly looking. We had a hypothesis. The camel was not in all, you know, it was a livestock hypothesis. We really, you guys were asking this, we were asking this. We were asking bats because we knew coronaviruses are bat associated, or many of them, not all. And, and, and we knew that livestock, so in a hypothesis-driven ecological hypothesis, so what, what do we eat, what do we caress, what is in our homes, what is most abundant in a given part of the planet, and then the evolutionary parts, because you are much more exposed to your livestock than you are to a bat that may fly over your house, although we have examples where we have direct bat-to-human transmission, that's, you know, it's not likely to be the most plausible um, um, route of infection, source of infection. So it's, it's important to have hypothesis where you look. So once, so when there's an outbreak, you have to look at all the epidemiological parameters and start to make hypotheses about mm -hmm. where to look, right? Because mm -hmm. you can't look everywhere. And, yeah. and with MERS, you started looking at livestock. That was the idea, right? It was one of the ideas, one of the hypotheses. Um, and, and then, of course, asking what livestock is present on the Arabian Peninsula. Uh, because it's so different from, from many other parts. Uh, like in, in Europe, when Marion said that today, that we have a huge swine population, that we are not even dealing properly with all the viruses. But in, Ara in the Arabian Peninsula, obviously, there's very limited uh, uh, holding of, of swine, at least not for food, for obvious religious region, uh, reasons. And, and, and so, I mean, what, what did you look at? Goats? Uh... Yeah, we just looked at the FAO stat uh, yes. of what animals are around there mm -hmm. in the Arabian Peninsula, and then just tried to get samples from all those animals. And uh, the, the hardest ones were dromedary camels, but there happened to be dromedary camels on the Canary Islands mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. that we didn't right. know, and those had antibodies, so that was right. what the initial trigger Interesting. was. Interesting, yeah. yeah. Did you also find, so no other animal was positive, but recently you found it in alpacas, right? Correct, yes. And where were they? Also in Qatar, so we've had a long collaboration in Qatar. Uh, and those were alpacas which that were in in contact with dromedary camels. So uh, and they have been used also as as as, as animal models. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we already knew they were they were susceptible. I see. And we have, have been sort of looking around uh, uh, with the Qataris to, just to see what else would you sample. Mm -hmm. have, we've been sampling bats. We've been sampling different types of rodents. Um, uh, Ticks, uh, flies. Do we anything they come and and, and send to us? <laughs> do we un do we know where camels got it from? Do we suspect? Yeah, I, I mean my 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 hypothesis, the evolutionary information that we have, f 
shows that MERS coronaviruses have evolved in bat ancestors very clearly. We've sequenced and, and an evolutionarily analyzed a bat uh, virus that belongs clearly, according to ICTV taxonomy, to the same species as MERS. Yet it's a very different virus. And, um, and there's a number of other viruses that uh, are related to MERS. So there's very little doubt that as many other uh, coronaviruses, these viruses have evolved in bats. And then there was this, there must have been a, a, a first host switch from bats likely into camels. Now the evolution is always complex and you can always only hypothesize. So whether there were additional hosts in between, who knows? Mm -hmm. The evidence that we have says, um, from the evidence that there is, I would clearly say it's bats and with or without intermediate hosts into camels. And there's absolutely no doubt that camels are the source of infection. But again, camels did not evolve MERS over very long periods of time. That was bats. And you've Very come cool. around to the view that bats are special. I think they are special under a given hypothesis where we look for exactly. I think, and Linfa has shown that for immunology they are special. We think that for the ecology they are special. And there's many things about bats. But I would also, I would not give in on Peter Daszak's uh, doubts about are bats really special because on many occasions. So the answer, you know, when to, it was 2005, so SARS came, Ebola, Eric Lora found phylo, Ebola virus in, in bats, and then John Towner found Marburg viruses in, in, in other bats, and, and it's clearly not all bats. So bats are special for a lot of viruses, but by no means all. Right. Yeah, and I don't think it's important for flu. I don't no, no, probably not at all. Well, flu <laughs> has been, other, I know, okay, wait a other minute. flying things. But yeah. there have been flu oh, viruses in bats, so. Yeah. But they're very different. They they're are very different. They're very different. And, and I, I, I'm very, I think that's a very important point because sometimes we got asked, though, okay, how relevant? So, so now bats are a major evolver of influenza A viruses. And no, not at all. No, no, no. Not at all. No, no. Especially, I mean, we've been, we've, together with some colleagues, we were asked to look for variants. Mm -hmm. And um, that was very limited. And I very much liked your serological analysis, actually, of bats and influenza A because it was completely unrelated to age 18 and age 17. Mm -hmm. And, and yeah, this, so there we saw some, again, antibodies and who believes antibodies, but we did see antibody reactivity to H9-like uh, antigens. And uh, so far, uh, I don't think, well, we try to, uh, with, with Bonn, try to then find if there were also mm -hmm. viruses in them and nothing, nothing was found. But from the antibody profiles, you would think that maybe there's something more there that, uh, that needs to be looked at. But there's an interesting story that uh, uh, one of the old Sudanese camel workers was telling in, in, in Qatar. And he said that uh, because of, so uh, the region has really boomed uh, with the oil and the gas. And then if you are a wealthy Qatari, what you do is you get more camels because that's your hobby and your pet and you have beauty contests with them and you race and there were so many more also because of the there's more people so camels for food that they started to import and because of that they started to so the the animals were no longer to uh, allowed to to graze or free free uh, uh, roam so all these changes that really help mm. explain that it, it's mm -hmm. it's an outbreak in the making and then very interesting stories that they started to uh, crank up the the, the racing business mm -hmm. uh, with different types of food and a big change is that they started to feed the camels, the racing camels, camel milk and dates. Mm -hmm. And I always thought that was a very interesting story that, you know, it's a very big change in mm -hmm. diet right. of an animal mm -hmm. that, that really could have introduced yeah. things. You know, I have to ask you, since you're talking about camels, I think you mentioned that it's going to be hard to vaccinate mm. camels against MERS. Tell us about that. Yeah, so because the camels do not, uh, they are not sick, at least that's certainly not uh, what, what the Qataris or the Saudis think. Um, there's actually been this, this uh, kiss the camel uh, yeah. uh, mo movement. Um, <laughs> I'm not entirely sure that we know that there's no uh, disease because if you look, the mortality on a young camel is, is up to 10% and no one is looking there. So that's what we've tried to push for, you know, look there and do uh, pathology, try to right. do pathology there. Um, so but it's not that, perceived as a threat. It's certainly not perceived as a threat. Um, and uh, anything you do to mess with camels, 
better not uh, <laughs> be hazardous. Yeah. Because but, yeah. but losing 10% seems to be a lot. You would imagine that that would spur someone to action to, to look at that? And that's not the case. So that's actually, I think, and that's interesting uh, in itself, and that is happening in many um, sort of more rural animal herding situations. This is just, yeah, young camels die. Mm -hmm. and, and there's no program to really investigate. That's really, I mean, it's really odd to, to hear. Yeah. It's, it's really different from the Hendra horse yeah. vaccines yes. where the horses all die. And so, yeah, vaccinate my horse. And yeah. plus it's a race horse. Well, they're race camels too, right? They're expensive. There's race camels and those uh, could potentially be vaccinated, but they're, so there's a whole business and, and all, all sorts of blood uh, measurements. So you have to be sure that your vaccine doesn't do anything there. Mm -hmm. uh, but one thing that I think could be interesting is because, because of the booming population, what also happens in Qatar is they bring in camels from Australia, wild camels. Mm -hmm. And those are zero negative. Mm -hmm. So what happens, they are brought all together in this market. The zero negative camels from Australia mixed with Qatari camels, mm -hmm. mixed with Sudanese Your camels. Mm -hmm. So that's right. where it's like the classic shipping fever. Yep. That's a veterinary yep. term. And you get these viruses everywhere. Mm -hmm. Right. So if you would, uh, I actually talked to someone in Australia, maybe you should just, you know, vaccinate the camel mm -hmm. before they get on the boat. Good idea, yeah, mm -hmm. protect them, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I Marion, mean, just as an add-on, I, I mean, you're mentioning the altered ecology of, like, of, of camels upon their arrival on the Arabian Peninsula. I think that's a crucial piece of information because that's what really says general infection biology principles. You yeah. put all of these camels into conditions that are very tight, so there's lots of animals, susceptible animals, and that's where we see the virus cooking up. And I think that's, that's also really important. So if we don't, if we can't convince them to vaccinate, then we need to convince them to, to think about hygienic measures. Because at the end, MERS is, is a hygiene problem much more than, it's not a highly transmissible virus, at least not among humans. We don't know really among camels, but we see the differences in, in cir MERS circulation in African nomadic camels, which have perfect Somali, camel, how do you say that, uh, people that take care of them and that, you know, they're so good. The camels are, they are, they are just fine. And it's so different upon their arrival in these huge markets and ships. On yeah, the I think it's similar to the flu stories. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and Peter Lesak mentioned it today. I think a lot can be done without vaccinating, but just by looking at how that market situation yeah. is. It's better and animal husband. Not mix them, you know, mm -hmm. put them apart and then uh, send them to the slaughterhouse. I, that's the, that's, yeah. so they put them all together for a month or so, then send them to slaughter. Don't do that. And you probably get rid of a lot of the circulation of virus. You're basically replicating a, a camel version of recruiting troops for World War One during exactly. the 1918 flu. Yeah. Exactly. All right, Ralph, let's bring you into this. Um, you, t you were in the understand section, kind of fundamental, it's the virology that I grew up with. Uh, right. <laughs> understanding, you get these new viruses and then you start to understand how they work. So what I wanted you to explain to us, a cool part, just a part of what you had talked about, the collaborative cross what, and what you could do with it. So tell us what that is and, and how it arose. Okay, so, um, if you, if you take it back to the most fundamental level, uh, much of our understanding of immunology is, has been focused, um, and viral pathogenesis has been focused, and microbial pathogenesis has been focused on um, highly inbred mice that can be traced back to about 1910. And those mice were kept in captivity and raised, and that's what we've studied. Well, humans are a little bit different. They, uh, uh, they usually don't inbreed, uh, usually. Um, they are outbred. Um, their genetics are heavily scrambled. The susceptibilities in, in human populations are heavily scrambled. And so their response to pathogens or immunogens is quite different than what would happen in a highly inbred model system. And so at a very fundamental level, the whole basis of the collaborative cross is to challenge the paradigm by which we do basic research in, immuno in immunology and viral pathogenesis. And it argues that natural variation that has, been, has evolved in mouse strains over, uh, over millions of years 
Uh, some of that has been under very similar selective pressures than what's happened with pathogens that have been in human populations. And while the mutations won't be the same, the genes may be the same or the pathways that get activated may be the same. And so you'd have a much higher uh, uh, probability of mimicking human outbred responses in this resource than you would in what we have used for the last oh, 50 to 60 years in science. And so a group of mammalian geneticists in the uh, early 2000s got together and decided they ne needed to develop a new mouse resource that uh, was designed for systems genetics and being able to do, um, to look at uh, complex traits. These are complex traits means that many genes regulate a particular phenotype. And it came up with a collaborative cross. Uh, many, many researchers were at the University of North Carolina. Mark Heise, who's in the Department of Genetics, and I got involved very early on um, to participate in this resource. And uh, through uh, a fair amount of funding, a little bit of funding, really, uh, outside of NIH, that group began to develop that resource simultaneously in a couple areas of the world. They chose, they sequenced mice all around the world. They decided, let's choose these eight founder strains after a lot of late nights and arguments that occurred over rodents <laughs> instead of flu vaccines. By the way, I got really sick last year, and I blame you. <laughs> I know you didn't raise I your didn't hand. Raise if you hand. had raised your hand, I might not have gotten sick. That's why I raised my hand. Ralph would yell at me. <laughs> So anyway, where was I? Uh, so uh, they, cho they ended up cho choosing uh, representative strains from domesticus, uh, three different substrains of mice. And these are wild mice. These are, mostly. well, so, uh, so that was the, that was the, the big that argument. That was an argument. That okay. was the big argument. <laughs> so um, many researchers had based their career on the, these standard laboratory strains, and they had models of disease that they wanted to capture and be able to map susceptibility alleles or genes or, or that regulated their particular phenotypes. And so they insisted on five of these standard strains, uh, four of the standard strains. The geneticists who had sequenced strains all around the world were looking for uniform diversity so that they could maximize the amount of diversity. Um, and so they chose wild-derived strains from uh, nature. So you had city mice and country mice. City and country the, mice, okay. right. And the country mice brought in all kinds of great stuff. Right. Okay. Yes. So um, over the next preceding 10 years, uh, they, they uh, researched at UNC and uh, in Israel and Australia, um, have developed that resource. There's about 100 lines now that have been uh, fully uh, derived. So basically, these eight lines are taken, they're crossed. So the genetics, the genes in each of these eight lines get scrambled differently every time. So you're breaking all the structure in the uh, networks that, that regulate expression and you scramble them in new ways. And um, so um, then those are bred and uh, in, into multiple unique lines that have different combinations of pieces of the genomes from those eight founders. So they respond differently. You hold your virus constant and you infect them, and some mice gain weight. Some mice are fully resistant. You can't infect them with your virus. Uh, some mice have mild disease. So let's say working with a respiratory virus, you'll have mild upper airway disease. If you look for virus antigen, it's only in the large airways. There's nothing in the deeper levels of the lung that are associated with pneumonia. Others have no, no airway disease and just massive disease in, in the, the parenchyma, in the alveoli where oxygen exchange occurs. And so the phenotypes are massively different. So one of, the, one of the nice outcomes of that is you have new animal models for human disease. And so uh, you don't have to mouse adapt the virus. You basically have to infect a panel of these lines and find a line that's highly susceptible. Uh, the other beauty of that is that they've all been sequenced. Uh, so you can map uh, with high precision uh, regions of the genome that are driving a particular phenotype. And so then you can identify the gene, identify the mutation in the gene that's driving the phenotype. And um, the direction that we're going now is that with the, with the Thousand Genome Project, you can identify an allele or a mutation that you think is responsible for your phenotype in the mouse, 
and then go and take a look at that gene in, in a thousand different human genomes. Uh, if the structure of the protein is known, you look for uh, similar mutations on the same interface location or within an active site or within a critical domain that's critical for folding of the protein. And we found many examples where it may not be the same mutation, but it's the same mutation in a different location that would actually disrupt the protein function. And so um, we're now moving into approaches to actually take those human mutations and drop them back into the mm. mice to see if they drive the phenotype. So this only is going to work for viruses that can infect mice? Or do you reveal new susceptibilities when you infect all the, the outcrossed mice? So if the, if the virus can't infect the mouse, <clears throat> and a good example of that is with MERS coronavirus, we tried to infect collaborative cross mice with MERS coronavirus. Um, and and uh, if the virus can't infect the animal, then you then you're not going to get an improved animal model of disease. That's the, Out of curiosity. It, it has to replicate. <laughs> now, if it can replicate somewhat um, a th to a 1,000 or 10,000 fold uh, PFU or infectious units, uh, typically you can improve on that up to about three logs, a 1,000 fold. And um, that's by a real a serial plus. passage or by? No, that's just by screening lines. Screening lines, OK. Right. So. Uh, Mark Heisey has some very interesting data with an improved mouse model for Zika right now that he's identified without having to adapt the virus to the mice. Other viruses are much more recalcitrant, like dengue. It does, doesn't grow it hardly at all in the mouse. And trying to improve it in the collaborative cross has been, let's see, angry. Well, you were <laughs> trying to find another description. Stressful. 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 I think frustrating. Been frustrating. Yeah. Now, what's, what's really striking about this approach, though, is aside from the, the fact that you now have sequencing to turn to, this is an extremely classical approach. You're crossing yes, mice is. and you're looking for phenotypes yes, in disease, is. and then you're going from there. And um, I guess nowadays it would be called a forward genetic approach, but uh, it's a, it's it would, just be, it would be, so just be genetics. Genetics. Yes, it's, just plain. it's genetics. Don't yeah. do the it's, forward and reverse. Yeah, we, we've got a thing about the forward and reverse genetics. So is any, can anyone get these mice? Yes. Uh, there's a, you can actually order them from U University of North Carolina. There's a website, Collaborative Cross. You can go in and buy breeder pairs. Uh, Great. Some of them are available at Jack's. Um, I, I thought that was important to highlight because this is, and you talked about results using uh, coronaviruses with these mice, but many other viruses can be investigated, and I think they're really important. Uh, so far, almost every pathogen that we've placed in those mice have given interesting phenotypes. Yeah. And not, not only for viral pathogenesis, but also for <laughs> allergy. Aging uh, experiments are very interesting. So um, we've done some studies where um, looking at vaccine performance as a function of age. The problem with aging experiments in the mice is I'm going to age out of them, I think, before we publish. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Uh, but uh, when you age the mice about a year, year and a half, uh, depending on the line, you, you can run from a vaccine failing completely to the vaccine working as well as it would work in a 10-week-old ten ten mouse right, right. to vaccine-induced immune pathology, uh, depending on the genetics. So all of that can be mapped. Once you have extreme phenotypes, you can map that. Uh, uh, the Lineberger Cancer Center at the University of North Carolina has been a major funder of the Collaborative Cross, and there are several groups that have been working on that. There's a new model for uh, colitis and a few other diseases that have been looked at. Now, what about norovirus? Uh, norovirus is one of those uh, difficult pathogens that only recently has been uh, cultivated in two systems. And uh, there is a mouse model that's heavily immunosuppressed. Uh, I have not tried to do noroviruses in the collaborative cross. I think that's uh, that needs to be someone young who <laughs> <laughs> willing to take a chance. Right. And uh, that's not me. On that note, we'll wrap up this episode. All the episodes of TWIV, you can find them in iTunes. You can find them at microbe.tv. You can find them with any podcast app on your iPhone or Android device. And we love getting questions and comments. We usually answer them on every show. You can send them to twiv at microbe.tv. And consider supporting all the shows we do. We do other podcasts besides twiv. We do microbiology, parasitism, evolution, and many more. You can go to microbe.tv contribute 
to learn how to do that. I want to thank everyone today for participating from the University of North Carolina, Ralph Barrick. Thank you very much. Pleasure to be here. From the German Center of Infection Research, Felix Drexler. Thank you so much. Thank you. From St. Jude's Children's Research Hospital, Stacy Schultz Cherry. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. From Erasmus Medical Center, Marion Koopmans. Thank you very much. Yes, you're welcome, and welcome in Rotterdam as well. <laughs> Thank you. I'd love to come. TWIV would love to come and uh, highlight everything that's going on there. It would be fun. And our special co-host from Boston University, Paul Dupre. Thank you, Paul. Thank you. Thank you. It was great, great meeting and it's all that. Great. And as usual, Alan Dove. You can find him at turbidplaque.com. That's his website. You can also find him. Uh, on Twitter. Thank you, Alan. Thank you. It's always a pleasure. And I just wanted to point out it's it's 73 degrees and humid outside. Uh, we always we mention the weather. Can't on. miss <laughs> the weather. Thank you. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank the American Society for Microbiology for sponsoring this episode and our producer, Chris Kandayan, behind the camera there. I also want to thank the organizers of EIDA to Z, Paul Dupre, Ron Corley, and Jerry Kirsch. Thank you guys so much, and thank you for having TWIV twice at this meeting. We really appreciate it. I also want to thank the sponsors of this show, Curiosity Stream and Drobo. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Mm -hmm.